my name is Carol Mankiti, and I have the honor of welcoming you all. So, my husband was Ifani Mankiti, who passed away a couple of years ago, who rescued the Grow Your Store. He loved it, and he, he owned it for 15 years, and when he passed away, myself and my four children vowed to keep it going. So, it's going great with James. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Pavlock. I'm one of the editors of Hanging Loose magazine and Hanging Loose Press. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the readers tonight. Um, we're going to start out with, uh, with Indram Amirathanayagam, who has a new book out from, from Hanging Loose Press. One of three books he's published this year uh, in three different languages. So, uh, Indram. Uh, three books with hanging on this now? Three, three books, yeah. Uh, I, I, finally remember, I finally remember the very first one, uh, which was a, an award-winning book. Uh, exciting. Uh, Indran grew up in Sri Lanka, uh, came to the States here and went to college at Haverford, and uh, has been working in the diplomatic corps many years now. So he's traveled all over the world and acquired uh, a great number of languages in which he has great fluency. So he actually writes poetry in English, uh, French, Spanish, and he has a selected poems in Spanish that just came out that he's going to perhaps read from tonight. Uh, Haitian Creole. Am I missing anything? In Portuguese. In Portuguese. <laughs> How could you leave that out? Um, Indran is, is the author of 20 books of poetry. And he's going to read about 12 minutes from each of those 20 books. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to request for that drink. <laughs> I did bring my book, uh, Luke King. So uh, anyway, so it's a great pleasure. Indran, uh, Indran is a... a is a romantic poet at heart, uh, and uh, really, uh, he's, I mean, 20 books is obviously he's prolific, uh, but if you were on his uh, email distribution list, you know, we, I get about an email, a new poem in one language or another every other day, so he certainly puts me to shame. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to introduce John Mirathamani. Thank you so much. Um, maybe because I've published 20 books, I should read without a book in my head. Um, I'll actually begin with a poem from memory, which um, for me uh, helps me remember Alistair Reed, who a great poet and translator who helped me with this poem. He took out the last two lines and, and it stayed as it is. You must love. You must love the land when you leave to build your house on the sea. Love what's lost, the mango tree burning in the garden, the curious noose of the familiar coat of arms. Love the ball turning strong, spinning in a dark, faraway land. Love the tongue you'll never again speak that wrapped you and bled you and dried up some every day on the other side of the sea. So ironically, even though I speak a number of languages, I lost a language, just Tamil, the language of my childhood. I spoke three languages then, Tamil and Sinhalese and English. And when I got to England as a kid, eight year old, eight and a half, I think, some jarring experiences, and I said to myself, I'll never speak this language again. I, and I guess I kept my dark, compromised word, and I've always regretted that. 
now I'll read from, just for a whole time's sake, I read from this book here many years ago. It came out and I thought I'd read you one poem from the Elephants of Reckoning. The City with Elephants. The Elephants of Reckoning are bunches of scruff men and women picking up thrown out antennae from the rubbish bins of the city to fix on their tubular bells and horn about by oil can fires in the freezing midnight of the old new year. We ride by their music every hour in cabs on trains hearing the pit pat of our grown wise pulse shut in, shut out from the animals of the dry season, the losers and boozers. We must not admit our eyes into that courtyard, the whimsy of chance and our other excuses, dollars in pocket. To write beautiful songs is all I ask God, to do right with friends and love a woman and live to 80, have people listen to the story of my trip to America. The elephants of reckoning are beaten and hungry and walk their solitary horrors out Every sunrise, slurping coffee bought with change, while in some houses, freedom bound lovers embrace late and read to go about the people working underneath the falling of empires. You know, Tagore was a big, great traveler, and I've had the luck of traveling a lot in my life. And, um, also an Indian nationalist, and I'm, I guess I'm a Tamil nationalist um, for a country that does not exist, Elam, which is the, uh, the country that the Tamils fought for in that terribly uncivil war that finished in Sri Lanka. Um, now I'll read from a book called Coconuts on Mars, which came out in 2019, um, Living Will. These are, these, there are copies of these books here tonight. One day I will sit down with my soul and write that I have loved every bird that flew, every monkey on the branch, every elephant charging through the grass. I will say I love you as much as the baby gecko scampering past my foot, the snake rustling under the wood, cut and stacked in my yard. I will say I have loved every creature, every song, every turn in the road, and I will be lying with my eyes open and my eyes closed. I'm not God. I'm not even the dog loyal to his master who misses him blind like his daughter in Lima, which I call at night until the next time we meet in dreams via chat, cheek to cheek, remembering that in paradise there are no trains or roads or seas or death. No going away, no arriving, doors and gardens open, souls who come and go smiling, and all the angels, all birds, all dolphins, all men and women in song dancing. And why not reciting the song of Solomon, the epic poems, the love songs that consoled when we set off on the roads, hopped on trains and aeroplanes, got caught in traffic in our head, said goodbye, before saying hello, did I know you down there? You were the green grocer I walked past going to school in London. Oh my dear, how beautiful you are, Pauline, with ripe red hair, who shared the religion prize with me at St. Vincent's on Blandford Street. But you may be alive still, and I'm not ready to meet my maker, to be plucked from the cycle of rebirth. Not yet. I have poems to compose children to raise, earth to cultivate. Come back later, angel. I have my will to revise. Thank you. Um, this book, The Splintered Face, uh, was my second book, with Hanging Loose, and, and I wrote it after the tsunami of 2004, the Boxing Day tsunami, the great Asian tsunami, which I couldn't believe it. I was listening to the radio in Rockville, Maryland, and I heard the stories of thousands of people were disappearing from the beaches of, of Sri Lanka. And of course, Indonesia, and many more, and, and um, 
the cataclysm, and I couldn't understand why this island was being visited by this cataclysm after the Civil War and so on. It, it, it just uh, couldn't quite get my head around it. I've since learned that cataclysms visit certain places quite a lot. I mean, Haiti is a country I'm very close to, and, the, and that has been hit by so many. Anyway, this poem, the title poem of this book, Face. Imagine half your face rubbed out, yet you're suited up and walking to the office. How will your mates, how will your mates greet you with heavy hearts, flowers, rosary beads? How shall we greet the orphan boy, the husband whose hands slipped, children and wife swept away? How to greet our New Year's and our birthdays? Shall we always light a candle? Do we remember the time erases the shore, grass grows, pains modified? At Hikajua in 1980, I wrote a ditty, a sailor's song, about rain in sunny Ceylon. I don't know what Calypsonians would compose about this monstrous wave, this blind hatchet man. Don't know the Baila singer's reply. We are a happy and go people, yet the fisherman's wife knows her grandfather was eaten by the ocean. Fisher communities have suffered in time, and what's happened now is just another feast for that bloody sleeping mother lapping at her island. But what if the ocean were innocent? The tectonic plates innocent? What if God were innocent? I do not know how to walk upon the beach, how to lift corpse after corpse until I am exhausted, how to stop the tears when half my face has been rubbed out beyond the railroad tracks and this anaesthetic this calypso come to the last verse. What shall we write in the sand? Where are gravestones incinerated? Whose ashes are these earned and floating through a house throttled by water? Shall we build a memorial some calculated distance from the sea in a park in the shape of a giant wave where we can write the names of the dead? Has the wave lost its beauty? considered now obscene, yet tomorrow, tomorrow, we must go to the ocean and refresh ourselves in the sea breeze down in Hikadua, where it is raining in sunny Ceylon. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we must renew our vows at sunrise, at sunset, let us say, let us say the next time the ocean recedes and parrots gawk and flee and restless dogs insist their humans wake up we will not peer at the revelation of the ocean bed, nor seek photographs. We will run, we will run to higher ground and gather there with our children, our cats, our dogs, our pigs, with what we've carried in our hands, albums, letters. We will make a circle, kneel, sit, stand in no particular direction and pray and be silent and open our lungs and shout thanks to our gods. Thanks to our dogs. Thank you. Um, naturally, there's a little bit of a debt to T.S. Eliot there at the end, you know, the, the dog that you, in the garden, you know, in that poem that we all have read, The Wasteland. I just want to read one poem for you from, in French, which is also a new book, Sur l'île Nostalgique. Uh, and, and just to have, uh, and, you know, every week I write a poem in French, a column in a Haitian newspaper. And so if any of you would like to receive those poems, Mark referred to these email. <laughs> You'll be, leave me your email and I'd be happy to, to oblige. Um, a brief poem called Le Pays à Côté. It's a country beside us. Viens avec moi, la porte est ouverte. La citerne pleine, et il y a tout d'une île pour explorer, un univers dont la mer est sur la terre. Mais en même temps, répondit la question, pour combien de temps Un mois, un an, une vie. Et si le chat a neuf filles, pourquoi pas l'homme à l'étranger, de pays en pays, jusqu'à l'arrivée au pays sans chapeau, la roue de l'enterrement dans le cœur du nerf, en centre-ville. Le pays sans chapeau. You know, so that's why I keep my hat on my head. <laughs> <laughs> to avoid that country without. Um, now, 
I'll, uh, oh, funny, I don't have, uh, well, I'll take this right here. The book that, uh, and then I'll finish with Blue Window, which is mine. Go ahead. Now, from the migrant states, which uh, uh, there's a, it's an ambitious book, and there's a conversation with Walt Whitman throughout the book, and um, and I'll read uh, two poems. This one I wrote on Walt's 200th uh, birthday. And it goes like this, Walt 200. Break the locks, unleash the mind. Walt Whitman has left Pomenock. He is abroad, he is sitting among us in our soul. He flies the post with pigeons and the giant freight planes. He hops freight trains and rides into Mexico. He is on a P&O cruise visiting St. Kitts and Barbados. He has joined the Merchant Marine. He sails into Guantanamo. He throws fish in the sea in search of whales. He has the biggest, longest beard in the world. He jives, thrives, cavorts, shimmers. He's 200 years old today, and he does not give a flying rat. He's in your mind, Mr. President, even if you cannot smother or scratch or squeeze him out. He is gloriously spirit, gadfly, rabbit, and sloth. He nurses our democratic wounds. He knows how to write history from the pebbles view, the side glance of the wren, the snake hanging in the tree. He is black and white and all shades of gray. He is our friend and guide, and he will elect us every time we fall down. Let us go back to Pomenock with what we've learned these 200 years. Let us go back to set forth again Walt Whitman in our backpack. Thank you. Uh, the president referred to that, I think you all know what I mean. It's not the current document that I refer to. Um, in fact, next year I'm publishing a new book called 10,000 Steps Against the Tyrant. And again, the tyrant is that same president. And I hope this is being broadcast to my employer. <laughs> Employed, you know. The Foreign Service serves all presidents, actually. But there's one president I had to have a lot of trouble serving. Uh, a poem I wrote a number of years ago when my son was younger. Summer Chess for Anandan. You go now, and I'm sad, and the sadness will spill into late summer and autumn until we meet again when the leaves fall and chestnuts smack our memories of life. And you ask, Dad, did you always walk in Regent's Park when leaves turned red and yellow, and the morning bristled, and the sun seared yet left your skin cold? A cold sun, Dad. I feel it too. This summer that I thought would go slow has turned now into a sprinter's dash. Then what's to do? Yes. Write and fill days with friends and games and sums until next summer, until the next time we go to bed to know there's no morning flight and your queen and rook are ready to trap my king. And one more. Morning Mass, Halloween, for Lola. Hushed tones, place of worship, early morning, a woman kneeling in the pew could not get up. The priest brought her communion. Then another parishioner called for an ambulance. The fireman, a friend of the ambulance driver, arrived in his fire truck. They worked together naturally. What to do now? Walk to the font, dip fingers in holy water, then go out to my car. Paramedics will lay her on a stretcher pump her heart, wheel her away to the hospital. Life is coming to its end. A repeat. In my dad's case, his heart stopped while he kneeled at a pew. Nobody could revive it. He would have loved to see my daughter, 
smiling as she guards the witch's cauldron this Halloween, sweets in hand. Thank you. And I don't know how much time I have, but I'd like to read a few poems from the new book, Blue Window. Um, it's a book I wrote in Spanish, Ventana Azul is the title, and translated by Jennifer Rathburn into English, which was a wonderful experience for, for me and I think for her as well, just an exchange. Obviously, I worked with her on the English as well, but she also worked with me on the Spanish, so it's a, the book improved um, as a result. I'll just read, uh, I'll finish, I'm not sure how much time I have, but I'll finish with five minutes. about five minutes. Okay. Thanks. Sobre el cuerpo. Escribo sobre el cuerpo porque a pesar de las nubes de olvido, descubro que tengo uno todavía y se pueden alterar sus ambiciones, correr hacia arriba en el cerro, ilusionarme con amar de nuevo. On my body. I write on my body because in spite of clouds of oblivion, I find I still have one and its ambitions can be altered, run to the top of the hill, be fooled by love once again. Una pausa. Hasta luego, hasta la vista. Y no hay más tarde. Voy a dormir sin darte abrazo ni apapacho, sin alimento ninguno para tu fantasía ya de antaño. A pause. Goodbye, so long. There are no more farewells. I'm going to bed without embracing or pampering you, without nourishing whatsoever. Your fantasy, now gone. Una confession tardi. I'll just read the English, a late confession. Let us now confess to the priest, to the blank page, to our friends and parents, to the superintendent, to the doorman, that we will no longer walk underneath trees in the park at dusk, holding hands between kisses, or proofread verses nourished by that distant light that cleared the sky and the nocturnal cloak that protected us from the cold. Nor will we rise at dawn to read the mail and search for words that didn't give us light when we crushed the fallen petals that illuminated our time on earth last night. There was a request from Mark uh, to read the poem dedicated to, inspired by um, Niccolò, Niccolò Parra. I'd be happy to do that, just uh, I have to find it. Um, Niccolò Parra was a friend and he uh, very lucky to have known him in, in his life and a great poet, a very funny poet. When I first met him, um, well, I tell the story in this poem. Uh, the title in Spanish is Un fracaso, una mariposa. A failure, a butterfly. When Nicanor invited me to dine on oysters and drink Cabernet in his house of wood in La Reina, we spoke in that 1995 of his visit to New Delhi and his adherence to the Hindu idea of leaving ties, family, goods, sex, and walking a beggar through the streets before arriving at the forest to wait for the butterfly to beat her wings, her blinding light. Ten years later, another visit with the poet, this time in Las Cruces, before the sea, and he asked me to read Antonin Artaud about the absurd in modern life. Once again, we remembered the butterfly. Four years later, he told me to accompany him to his studio in the garden next to his house, my only path now. And seeing a poetry book of mine on his shelf, he commented that he loved the title, El Infierno de los Pájaros. Now the news arrives that he's been awarded the Cervantes Prize. At 97 years, I wonder if he will break his customary path and take a plane to Madrid. Arto should have the answer, or the Hindu beggar, or no one. He drew me a gift that first time. The motto says, everyone fails in his own way. In the Spanish, dice el lema, cada uno fracasa a su manera. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I think I'm probably running. I'll finish with two short poems. This one is called Viaje. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, maybe I'll just finish with a, a found uh, a poem composed on the moment. No, say. Let me just finish with this one poem. It's called In Pocas Palabras Todos. I'm very, much learned a lot from what Ezra Pound did to his poem in the station in the metro. It began as a 26 line poem, it ended up as a two line poem. And I just spent some time in Paris where I, you know, was on the metro a lot. And, and I, in this case, I've been able to distill the, the business down to three lines. So I'll read the Spanish and then the English. In pocas palabras, todos. Nacen, crecen, se enamoran, se decepcionan, sobreviven, se enamoran, sobreviven, se alegran, dejan de crecer, disminuyen, se mueren. In a few words, everyone is born, grows, falls in love, is disillusioned, survives, falls in love, survives, is happy, stops growing, diminishes, dies. Thank you very much. Poet, uh, the contemporary of Neruda's, of, of uh, similar stature in uh, Latin America, in the world. Uh, so the next uh, reader will be uh, Dick Lurie. Um, somewhere back in uh, 1966, he got the bright idea to join a bunch of people and start producing a, a mimeographed uh, poetry magazine. Uh, that became, and it hung loose. It was literally mimeographed pages stuffed in an envelope with art on the cover of the envelope. So it hung loose, and of course, this, it was the 60s, so everybody hung loose. Uh, and uh, as our uh, recently deceased co editor uh, used to say, that uh, he thought he was just joining this you know, group of guys putting together this little magazine. How much work could it be? Uh, little did I know, he said, uh, that it would be a life sentence. <laughs> so, 55 years later, which is the remaining founding editor of Hanging News, I'm just a kid, I've only been doing it 40 years, uh, and uh, we keep going. Dick is uh, the author of uh, eight poetry collections now. Uh, he's also uh, a musician, a multi-talented musician. Uh, he plays the trumpet, which he'll play for us tonight. Uh, he plays guitar and writes songs, so he has two uh, recordings of children's songs that were published by Folkways uh, back in the 70s, I think? 70s, yeah. Yeah, they're now digitized, so they're still available for children. They're terrific. Uh, my son loved them. Um, and he, in 1980, I believe, when he came to Boston, he decided to take up the saxophone, mm -hmm. which uh, has become uh, vocation of his, uh, and uh, he, so he plays uh, in blues clubs all around town. Uh, he also plays uh, in Clarksdale, Mississippi every year at the Blues Festival, where uh, he's known as Dick the Poet. I hope you're wearing your, your, oh, your vest, okay. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Dick, my son was reading National Geographic uh, when he was in middle school, and there was a feature on the, the cultures of the Mississippi Delta. And it, was, it was started up in uh, the Mississippi River. It started up in Minnesota and it worked, worked its way all the way down to uh, Louisiana. And there were these little features about different, uh, different cultures along the river. And it got to Clarksdale, uh, home of the blues. You know, Money Water grew up in uh, Clarksdale. Uh, and uh, he said, Dad, look, there's Dick. And so it was a picture of a juke joint in Clarksdale, Mississippi with uh, three black musicians and Dick Lurie in the middle, in the middle uh, of, of, of the picture. So, uh, Dick's uh, most recent poem is uh, a wonderful distillation of poems about the blues and 
Uh, the title poem is a conversation between the blues and jazz. Uh, previous book, uh, that When the Delta Was the Sea, is really uh, a wonderful book about uh, the whole, his whole experience in Clarksdale and the music in Clarksdale. Uh, book previous to that is uh, Ghost Radio. Uh, and Ghost Radio uh, features a poem, Forgiving Our Fathers, uh, which is the final poem recited, if you know the, uh, uh, the Sherman Alexie movie, Smoke Signals. At the very end of the movie is the recitation of the poem, which is which is Dick's poem, uh, Forgiving Our Fathers. And uh, what else to say? Dick uh, <laughs> a few things first. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Indran. Thank you, Carol and James, for this whole thing. And it's, it's great to be here. Who set this up so that I have to follow Indran? Did somebody, <laughs> somebody do that? Uh, um, as Mark said, I'm a musician. And uh, uh, just one thing about, about uh, music. Um, um, yeah. Um, in uh, yeah, when you're a musician, you you get up on stage and you set up all that stuff, and, uh, and you look at the audience. And there's ten people, and you say, "Oh man, it's gonna be one of those nights." And everything's all set up, and um, and then when you do a, a poetry reading, you look out in the audience, you see there's ten people. You say, man, I got a full house. <laughs> 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 better than the full house. <laughs> And um, looking forward to hearing Sarah, and it's just a great night. Uh, <clears throat> this is a poem, uh, well, as, as the title says, I wrote this poem uh, in 1981, and uh, in the hopes that it would, uh, it would um, become obsolete. It's called February 1981, The Systematic Murder of Black Children. This is not a political poem. Giving out your views, as they say, in that sense of democratic debate, kicking it around in discussion and argument, would be, in this case, a distraction. So I went with a title that's plain fact you could quickly verify. Just discovered in Atlanta, the body of the 17th, 17th, black child murdered within the past year. Such a fact laid out so simply hard to forget might stick in your head a while, reminding you maybe whenever you see a black child that they are miraculous. What do I mean? We need to behave, of course, with love and respect toward all children. But as for black children, you have to remember that someone is out to kill them. Why? Because they are black children. And so, let them command your loyalty, your most clear and fierce attention. They are rare. They are in peril. Fewer of them will survive. Those who do are, yes, miracles. You must treat them like the bearers of your only hope for an end to the murders of black children. And uh, from the book, from Jam Session and other poems, this is a set of three poems. Uh, it's called The Little Richard Suite. Um, someone that I'm sure many of us have been influenced by and admire. And uh, so it's the three poems, The Little Richard Suite. The Birth of Little Richard. On December 5th, 1932, no one noticed an unusually bright star glittering over Macon, Georgia. It had been, after all, an eventful year, and astronomy was not the first thing on people's minds. Height of depression, 17,000 veterans march on Washington, 
Roosevelt wins election. Hitler loses, though not by a landslide. So nobody sees this star settling right over a house on Fifth Avenue. Bud and Leva May's third child, Ricardo Wayne Penniman, is born. Just months after Cole Porter's gay divorcee hits on Broadway, Hart Crane disappears at sea, Beecham founds the London Philharmonic, and Johnny Weissmuller makes his first Tarzan movie. Believers in synchronicity nod their heads here. But let's just remember that our book of famous events fails to list the number of black folks lynched in Georgia this year of our Lord, 1932. Succession. In Houston about 1953, Johnny Otis recalls hearing Richard perform. He's already flamboyant, though this is two years before the hits begin. I am the king of rock and roll, he says, and also the queen. Ah, this is brilliant, brilliant. The outrageous will always serve him well. The clown act, the costumes, the pompadour. Him? Ah, him? That fool? That queer? Of course, we don't see him as, as a threat. He's a joke. And, of course, nothing was safe. Their daughters, their sons, their world all changed, changed utterly, as Yates said. Richard in the forefront, Richard pounding the piano of revolution that would put an end to the America I knew as a boy when Norman Rockwell, I recall seeing his performance, told us, I am the king of your self images. But when we got through, the king was banished. Long live King Little Richard. <laughs> and uh, the last one is called Classic Rock and Oldies. Classic Rock, it's called, what this radio station plays, Beatles, Stones, Credence, Eagles, Janice, Led Zeppelin, The Who, Neil Young, Pink Floyd, okay, I, I get the idea. But why, why not just greatest hits? Why classic? Then I thought, oh, classic. Yes, like classical Greek, making, making the pitch for reputation beyond now. These will be eternal, like the statuary of Athens, temples, great open theaters of tragedy and comedy to create myth around some who are only human. I can see the point. But what about right next to it on this bright dial. What about this station purveying oldies? What about Laverne Baker, the Penguins, Flamingos, Coasters, Ruth Brown, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino? That, that is for us who remember, who can still dance the fish, the stroll, and the Madison, who play in 50s rock and roll bands, not, let us know, the rock bands who took it on themselves to sophisticate the role right out of the music. Ah, I get it now. Oldies, oldies is the heroic age. We are the ones Homer speaks of, camped before the walls of civilized Troy in our wildness, eating, drinking, singing all night around our fires. This is no Athens with its endless gossip about gods that they know only from a distance. In our, in our camp, the gods are frequent visitors. They bang our heads together to instruct us. They drink our wine and eat our food, jostling each other for the best morsels and laughing among themselves. They tell us, they tell us that the city shall fall to us. They anoint our leader with perfume and Homemade. They say that after we have danced three times around the walls of Troy, he shall stand with us. He shall speak in the voice of the gods. A wap babaloom up, a wap bam boom, and the walls will come tumbling down. <laughs> I 
think it was uh, Chekhov. Can you move that a little bit? Yeah. Great. Um, yep. Let me get this. Um, it was Chekhov who said that um, Chekhov who said that uh, if there is a if there is a, a a trumpet on the mantelpiece in Act One, then someone has to fire it in Act Two. Maybe it wasn't a trumpet. It was whatever it was. Uh, this is um, four poems. Um, it's called Four Poems Listening to Music. And um, it's all, uh, it's dream poems. They're dreams and, and on waking, um, for some reason, the dreams uh, get associated with, with particular songs. And you'll hear which ones they are. Let's go. And there's four. The first is Blues in the Night. to the unconscious, to be respected for its wisdom. And so I used to write down every dream quickly, afraid I'd forget it. Sometimes now I turn up the radio, make breakfast, read the paper, afraid I'll remember it, like this morning. But even now, late in the day, late in the day, my mind is too clear. So this dream, familiar, coolly presents itself I just can't get on the bus with all these shopping bags, take-out coffee, instrument cases, and no one will tell me what to do. Not Denise, now dead 20 years, and not Eric Satie, though I can hear that he's trying. <laughs> and then, of course, this one's called no piggy. Mm -hmm. Try not to blow my head 
the mic. You better be over here. said music is the perfect art. Here when it's here, sufficient, then gone. Record it if you must listen again, but you'll never see or touch it. The others try hard, but always seem to leave things lying around. Stone, words, paint splash, blade, crash, hand on your arm, nagging smell of someone's mortality. Who might that be? No wonder I took up the sax. How else could I even approach perfection? How could I even perfect, approach perfection? At night, in the bar, like the best kind of dream, I strap it on and by dawn forget everything. <laughs> back to 1981 and, and uh, hearing Hendren talk about remembering when we were all together in 93 and I and I um, and I thought back even further so this is um, way, as Mark said I used to be uh, a guitar strummer trying to get that back at some point but um, uh, and in the mid 1960s I lived uh, in the East Village which was not the same as it is now. This was the, the East Village where you could, um, where um, uh, a half a day's freelance work would get you a month's rent. So that was, that was then Avenue C and East 7th Street and Norfolk Street. And, and I wrote a song which I actually played on guitar and sang, uh, but um, I think uh, the guitar is not quite up to it yet. And, and I wasn't sure how it would go in here, so uh, I'll just sing it, I think. And uh, let's see. It's the most expensive uh, tuning for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Alright, so this is called, mm -hmm. this is called Sunday Afternoon Along East 6th Street, or Where Will You Be When the Puerto Ricans Ask Which Side Are You On? <laughs> oh, and I better try this again. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Puerto Ricans are out. Puerto Rican, Puerto Ricans are out by their cars in the street, just as if they were all getting ready. Some are washing and fixing their cars in the sun, and some stand around with cold beer. Que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. Que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. This course. When the news comes that Manhattan is about to crack in half, well, everyone's faced with decisions. All the high grounds uptown, but there's room for just a few. Or else you can go with the Puerto Ricans. Now they start polishing all of those cars, men, women, and children together. Que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. Que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. Now friends are arriving, they're all shaking hands from neighborhoods all over town. And the kids of all colors are dancing around and sucking sweet coconut ices. Mothers talking on stoops begin rounding up kids and everyone piles in the cars. There's at least 20 people in every back seat. Guitaras y cuatros también. Que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. Que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. When the split comes, the uptown half sinks right away. Solid citizens weighing it down. But the lower half smoothly moves out toward the sea. They all wave at the ships and start singing. Y que pasa, the whole thing just goes floating off to Puerto Rico in the sun. And the whole thing just goes now, it's all goes floating off to Puerto Rico in the sun. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Oh. I just should add that most most of the, the poems that Dick read uh, were from his book. True. Uh, but he <laughs> I snuck another at a certain age, you know, you need larger friends, so we're much better. Anyway, um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Sarah Cahill Naren, the final reader for the night. Uh, it's my pleasure to meet her. I, uh, I've met her sort of online through Beltway Magazine, where she's an editor with Indron. Uh, Beltway's, I guess, I mean, belt based on the, the, the DC Beltway. That's right. So uh, it goes around the world now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, online. Uh, so Sarah has two books in print and another forthcoming. Uh, reasons for the long term, and uh, nothing you build here belongs here. And her forthcoming book uh, from Mad Hat Press, uh, Call Me Spess, which will be coming out uh, later this year or early next year, right? So, yes, I, I have a book from them too. It's coming out imminently. Uh, anyway, so uh, her work appears widely in, in journals, uh, and uh, Suggestions make creed the sign of the cross and say, 
the Father is ours, too. Mary says, three hails be. The Father says, announce the first Father, and then say, mystery. While hailing Mary, the ten meditating say, on mystery. Say, the glory, the Father, the be, to. Say, the second mystery, announcing our third Father. Mystery continues in the same manner. Repeat, six and seven. These are the instructions for this book. <laughs> it's based on the structure of a rosary. Um, kind of come to think of it as poems that I've strung. Um, rosary is literally beads, and when you are praying it, you're to touch them, tactile things that you can can meditate on. And the cover of this book is a, a Duchamp painting that I really love, and Duchamp was very into the, the tactile and sort of uh, mimicking real life through his ready-mades, if anyone here is a fan. <laughs> and this is my ready-made rosary. Um, picked, I'll read two of you, two of the end of the first mystery, which is on art. Uh, the second mystery is lascivious, like sex and love. And then the third mystery in this book is letters, uh, communication, email, text, those kinds of things. It's a little more experimental. Nine. Angry over campaigns and car crashes, occult errors and evasion, and the cult of the corporation you slave to, rising red flames in the baby skin, cheeks for the bill, a bill, to change my rights, your rights, our rights, my bill, your bill, you pay. Furious, illusory, futurity, winking in and weaving, crackles of grand phone, AM, FM, waves too deep to recall, recoil instead, a medium channeling lotteries, translatable. 10. Themes of travel, museums, food, meat, explore. Pictures, awe, fulfill all at once, one awe, one ohm for Ginsburg to howl back at Blake. He's fucking figured it out. Channel, like the Mississippi, can't flip flop, but can fall in, flow through, as power harness, as water dams do, whirring for want of energy, efficiency, ill illumination, sand crystals, crushed cremations of pounded indigo ink running rapid like blood, kept by banks, held by stone, steel bridges in triptych stoism, staring towards los, futurity, in case man defaults towards water. Oh, Blake, turn your stem towards the spacious sun, a metamorphosis to sing, burn, bloom, ah, a metaphysics to move through space, to space out your face, Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, baptize you with your heritage trail. Walkers take the long, long walk. Ballet and Strauss would make Mary Shelley tickled. A creature such as this should have started small. Alas, ingenuity of brilliantly bur burdened Harvard professors, sanctioning romantic poetry between physics and philosophy. Nervous youth sings a sweet, innocent song to belie them all. Yet the falls roar too loudly, and thunderous claps echo and appropriate ageless chamber music watchers applauding the wind octet so liberated is the oboe death to the monarchy of forms. Mozart posits to compose one more minuet and in blows the collective breath of opus seven. Transcendence and incomplete motives at its very finest. Ah, sunflower wishes now to fold our syrup Onto your stalks so as to better trace the melody, music from romantics past. No to fever dreams, no to surrealism, no to deconstruction, to new criticism. Religious houses hoisted high for their lynchers to crucify. White blank, mark an A, an A, space in an A, mark the poem as space. Space the poem. Signed.
I was really into Derrida and <laughs> spacing at the time I wrote this poem. It's a little bit more interesting to read on the page because you can see some of that. Um, I wanted these to feel very musical, so I really loved listening to you, Dick. Uh, and I'm going to read these three in a row to get some of that music going. This is from Second History. Sex and love. One. Little drop of poison thrilling kills me kisses. I want you to kiss me like the stranger you once were. Drops of devil dances, bachata, back room, hookah, sweet breath, boss and sweat, taste sweet like lizard licks. Drops of liquid off dry desert bones, oh baby, so sweet, soak me through and I will be satisfied. I will breathe satisfaction, sing satisfaction, stay satisfaction, sigh satisfaction, let the bullet go through, back to the straight and barrel, back through the narrow, in and you're gone, snapped back, head cracked, arched back, spine fine, curved, courteous, head bent back, bar room blossom barring all backside, smooth for my fingers, my tips, my touch, my touching, my fingertips, touching tips of lips, panting, for parting. Two. Does she fuck you like I do? She stay the night here? Did you bring her back here to the bed? Do I know her? No one licks your pussy, licks like I do. No one fucks you, fuck you, like I do. Did she hit, slap, fuck, suck your fucking neck like this? She's younger than me. Everyone's younger than me. Cold collar, bitch, head, face, linoleum, sink. Submit, motion, feel me rip through flesh, black and blue skin from red and ripened lines, nails, ravaging, drift, strash, pass all along your back. Scream, baby, like your bloody pussy bleeds from my heart. You broke my heart. Three. Love is a babe, as you know. When you cradled her gently against your chest, Plumes of breast, a light for an infant, afraid to turn light to sound. Utterances, iterable, signs, signs, singing. Hush, little baby, don't say those words. Your mama never left you, so I'll hold your world. This love never is, never was, never will. Fraught with 41 years, bought warmth, swaddled like intensive care units is always how I, you, we've known truth. Commune, create disparate worlds in which Two adults do not learn to speak, but call each other baby. Love is a babe, as you know. Um, the third chapter of that book, I started to play a little bit with letters and communications, which I'll read what that later bloomed into, which is my third book, called Miss Bess. Um, I want to read a little bit from this new collection. This is my newest collection. Nothing you build here belongs here. The kind of ecological uh, ecological but also ghost poems, I think. They hold a lot of sadness. These were written partially during COVID, but I'll let you decide. This one I, I want to start with because it's, uh, I, I know, notice that the red line comes here, and this is also a, a red line train, but not yours. Waiting for faith. The train will come. I have faith in the train. The metropolis practice religion, the hoi polloi practice God, the trains run on timetables. Thank you for giving me hope. Well prayed. I am meditating on the red line, flashing lights of hobbled trains, my heart open like the gaping tunnel, kin with transport, ports of vessels, blood like bat flights, pearls of sweat tripping down my back, purgatory platform, waiting, waiting, unholy headache, unholy wrist watch, cracked time wrong, sipping slow, holy time so slow, slides, human ache standing still, we are packed, filled, salted, smogs, all breathing underground stench, hopeful as a new Christ, metalwork messiah, 
gliding over electricity and steaming heaps of crumpled food paper, newspapers, soil waste, backwater dead things, rat shit, pack traps, flip the third rail, humming a buzz that we are clean, cleaner than clean, and sheathed in smooth cabins rising from darkness. We emerge. New train. Now on another track. New train coming. That was a... That was before COVID because we were riding the train together. This one was a, I call this, a, this is an echo poem. It's written on the bones, which is why a lot of these poems feel like ghost poems to me because I used, um, I was really searching for answers during COVID as we all were. And so I, I just looked for, um, war poems because I noticed that at the beginning of that time uh, that language was being used in the news a lot. And this is uh, Tennyson's The Charge of the, Light the Light Brigade, Brigade. <laughs> and if anyone's familiar with that poem, it's um, about a, a, a suicidal battle essentially where the British cavalry charged against um, an army in the Crimean War and they were just slaughtered. And he, he had trouble publishing it, so he went around and actually sang it in the streets. At least that's the information that I have learned. Um, but what was learned from that battle was that military intelligence and communication is essential and important. Um, and I think that's something I've learned. This is called Breathe In, A People's War. One. Half a month, half a month. Half a month forward. Watched world of the screen, transmitting, ISP, my heart. Breathe in a people's war, stay in your homes, they said, a world of screens, transmitting, ISP, our hearts. Two. Breathe in a people's war, whose viral enemy digitized battle line citizens shall sanitize, their hands washed, their touch undermined, theirs not to hold nor redefine, into the world of screens, transmitting, ISP, my heart. Three. Patience to the right, patience to the left, patience in front, cough and heave, doubled over hot in hell, sick mixed with the well, 14 days alone, broken, abject, unknown. Transmit us, ISP, these hearts. For skeptics, kept faces bare, unmasked in naked air, shunned orders everywhere, immune to rule, while the rest of us wonder, huddled home, sheltered in place, the unmasked shout, seasonal or lab made, reeled from economic collapse, shuttered businesses plundered, false facts across news wires, transmit me, ISP, my heart. Five, patience to the right, patience to the left, patience in front, cough and heave, dump, doubled over, hot in hell, sick, mixed with the well, doctor and inflicted dive, nurses, clerks, drivers fell. 14 days more alone, distancing into phones, becoming digitized, transmit me, ISP, my heart. that ISP is Internet Service Protocol, for those that <laughs> don't know, um, just a way to refer to the Internet. I'm going to read a couple, I know it's getting late, release, a couple from the SPES book, which is not released, so forgive my phone, please. Um, I'm going to do my best with, with these because I've never read these particular poems before, but the theme of this book is that the iOS is narrator and it slowly over the course of the entire book learns the user through the voices which are other poems in the book. Um, so the poems I'll read to you are overheard from, you know, when you're sitting on a bus you hear all the conversations going on. Um, and then one other 
question, so I'll just read this one. One other footnote, um, Perl 6 is a type of coding language. I'll reference that. Okay, this one's called S9 Bus at 16th Street. I spess heard. Eaten peanut butter for weeks. I haven't seen it in a while. Was furloughed with the rest. Back door. The bus smells like piss. Do you usually take this route? Why are you always running late? You've lost weight. Are you bored with your life? What's wrong with rap and opera in the same playlist? Can you help me with this felony charge? I just got my license back. We rented the studio to record our album. One day I want to have a family. Do you dream about the bullet echoing off the skull? Your eyes have dark circles. Do you love me? Pass the lighter. Ten Valentine's Day ago I robbed that liquor store. We're getting loaded tonight, man. Back door. Call me when the checks come in. This means I love you. Dear user, in Pearl 6, I love you. Output 99 ways each unique. Do you string them up? Wear them around your neck? Pinned florals, lapels, earrings, loosely, softly, tightly? Love me? Which would you wear out? Put warm, soft kisses, hug. Hug, I, spes, unique, I love you dot TLC, say, say, output, I love you, 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 I love you. I love you. Thank you for attending, everybody. Um, let's give another round of applause for our I know it's getting late, but I think we might have time for one or two questions if anyone has a question to ask. James, James, are any of these books for sale? Yes, so we have the books for sale. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just going to put this. Um, I have a question for Indra. I have Indra. Oh, okay. 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 I'm, I'm very curious that you, I don't know what is your prime language, um, and, and I'm very curious that you write in, um, in a language that you need somebody else to translate into another language that you know sufficiently well that you could translate somebody else's work in Spanish on your own into English. <laughs> Explain that one to me, please. It's all a big game, I guess. No, no. No, I... I <coughs> it's very hard to know. You know, it's such a personal thing, you know, to, the choice of which language I, to dream in and to write in. And For me, without learning languages so obsessively and so thoroughly and intensely, I could not have chosen the career I chose, which is to be a diplomat, to to live in different cultures. And so I, I didn't want to be on the surf, live on the surface. It, to me, it, 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 it's a, a failure, you know. I had to become one of the people, even though I was a visitor, a guest, uh, invited, and I had a ticket out. So I, I for example, in Haiti, when I left, I was blessed by a, a big party, you know, and Frank Etienne spoke there, and you know, all these it was, uh, people who became my friends. And people that, I don't mean to, to prate about this, but I, people would say, you were not like the others. You listened to us and you walked with us, and, and you're one of us. So the search for belonging, but new homes. And so I feel at home in Haiti, I feel at home in Argentina, I feel at home in the United States. So I think in that sense that the language is so important to me to, to really to live as if I'm, I have the right 
derecho de sitio, I have the right to be there, you know. And uh, it's a very intense personal thing because I lost that original home, which doesn't even exist. I mean, Ceylon has been renamed Sri Lanka. The Tamil uh, identity has been now, I mean, when I was in Paris recently, I spoke in French to a waitress who was Tamil from Jaffna. Now, our bridge language was French, you know, not English. Um, I left her a copy of that book, Suli and Nostalgic. It was just, you know, I thought that was amazing, you know, because even though you might have had a traumatic family breakup, you know, the, not, we, not just your individual family, but the the, the, the whole people had to be uh, had to give up. They they find themselves uh, together again. So translation is very important. So your original question was, why do I allow that? I but I but I, there was a bit of fun in it too. You know, I mean Jennifer Rathbone liked the book, Ventana Azul. I gave her a copy of it when we shared a, a stage together at a, at a festival in New York. And then. It occurred to her to, to, to translate it. And I said, wonderful, you know. I didn't force the book on it, but she decided, made the decision. And then Google Docs are an, is an amazing device <laughs> for sharing. You're both there with your little beeps that you can modify in any way and go on. So ultimately translation is a is an act of love and and sharing and communion, and uh, <coughs> so I'm grateful that I had that experience. Some people have, have trouble uh, accepting that, you know, they, think, they say, well, you could have done this yourself, but I, to be honest with you, I, I could have translated it myself, but I would have felt terribly alone, and, so, and, and uh, <coughs> I don't know if I was up to it. This book would not exist without her translation, it just wouldn't exist in English. Not with me, not with my hand alone. So I'm grateful. I mean, it's a book I'm very proud of, and so is she, and I'm grateful that it exists. And it's been picked up by a publisher here in the US and given a very good presentation. You know, it's a, um, my son did the cover of the book as well, so that's another uh, pleasure for me to, as he did the cover of The My Good States. Thank you. I hope that. It was an answer to your question. Thank you, Mike. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Uh, I want to have a question for Sarah. Um, um, I, I did uh, spend eight years in. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, I did spend eight years as a child uh, with, with nuns. <laughs> My first uh, eight years of schooling. And I spent a lot of time in church with the rosaries, and uh, but the, the the mystery element. I see, see, perhaps I was too young. But, uh, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on the mystery association with the, in the rosary. On each chapter's theme. Yeah. Yeah. So the decades are supposed to be um, hail marys in a right. in a rosary, and the beginning. You know, I, created the instructions as, as a way to wrap the whole book in a bow. Um, obviously the poems are not the same Hail Mary prayer over and over again. <laughs> but the I did not follow the Christ uh, mysteries, you know, in terms of death, ascension, um, glorious, which is the movement. But I, I just used the Duchampian um, artistic structure to sort of make the I guess like the tactile beauty of what I what made me brought me comfort from a rosary because my my grandmother used to carry them all the time. She she often had three or four in her purse and she would pull them out and if you didn't have one she'd give you one. <laughs> and I, I remember she died. Um, my aunt had all of her rosaries mm -hmm. and we sat around in my uncle's house and went through them and I took set many. <laughs> um, and they, for me, I, I, went, I went through catechism and I was confirmed and I grew up Catholic. And so it was a, a symbol and a practice that brought me extreme comfort. So to answer your question, I guess in, in a sentence, the mystery itself I created. Uh, and I chose 
lyric, uh, sex and love, and then communication, because those were three areas that I really wanted to explore at the time. And they made sense in a really basic way, I think. Um, my publisher, when we finished the book, he said, you could update it with, with number four, because <laughs> there are some versions of the rosary where you, you pray only the three mysteries, and then there's some schools of thought that encourage you to play, uh, pray all four. So, you know, could leave the brass it and yeah. go back. Um, What's the fourth? Glorious. Okay. Glorious. So, I'm not sure what I would try, would add to this one. Um, I have a draft called Reasons for a Tantone, which is another work of Duchamp that I really love. <laughs> and I think maybe I just will work on that for now. Um, I don't know what the structure will be. But the structure is something that, that to me, was symbolic in my family and in my growing up of love. And so it shaped the way I thought of poetry and how I was able to use poetry in, in my daily life and walk through. So I wanted the book to be something like that for others when you are reading it, that it, is, it has a, like a tactile uh, use. Um, I don't know if it does that for people, but um, it did that for me as a writer, and maybe that's all we can do. Thank you so much, everybody.